I was born and raised in Las Vegas, Nevada, and my parents was uh, they're very, very. Um, I would say not helicopter parents, but they wanted me su to succeed. So they they pushed me to do well in school and academics, and uh, because of that, I was able to attend such a great university here in San Diego. So aerospace engineering, and being out of state. Uh, I knew that my, my dad was paying a pretty penny for me to go here. So I came in with a mentality of taking every opportunity that I could. So I joined all the clubs, went to all the events uh, from first year to, to fourth year. And because of that, I was able to find out what I like to do, what I love to do, and what I didn't like to do, which was also important. Um, so from there, I joined a club that 3D printed rocket engines. They received a small grant from NASA. Uh, to, to test additive manufacturing and propulsion systems. And uh, that wasn't really enough money to, to make a rocket, albeit just $5,000, that's, that's a lot asking for, for students. Uh, so we, we did a fundraiser, we sold barbecue chicken on Library Walk, and we raised $2,000 to build the rest of our test system. And in the fall of 2013, we became the first student group in the world to successfully design, print, and test uh, additively manufactured rocket engine out in the Mojave Desert. And we received a lot of attention for that. And shortly after that, the club asked me, a first year at the time, to recruit my own team and actually teach them all the rocket theory I knew, uh, which was very little, but enough, all the fabrication techniques that I knew, and go forth and test more uh, uh, engines, outfit our testing stand with more sensors and just collect more data. So that's what I did for a year. And as we traveled to different space and tech conferences, we had industry professionals come up to us amazed at what a group of undergrads could do. And they said, keep working on this technology. It will be very valuable in the future. And we even had small companies in the space industry come up to ask us, asking us to help them design some of their own parts. So they regarded us as the experts in 3D printing because they haven't touched it before. And it's such a new technology, um, especially in the aerospace industry. It's very risk adverse. So um, they, they rely on tried and true technology, even from the Apollo era. So. They, rocket technology has remained stagnant since the 70s. So stuff like this is something that hasn't been seen before. So naturally, a group of undergrad students with a very powerful technology and a pretty cool opportunity, naturally we decided to make a startup company. Uh, so we're called ARC, the Additive Rocket Corporation. Our mission is to, of course, democratize space by providing reliable and affordable propulsion solutions. I mean, I don't know about other people, but I mean, that's what we've been through. Uh-huh. So, so space exploration, it's, it's pretty debated. It's, um, what are the benefits of it? Uh, some of the arguments of is why focus on going out there when we have all of our problems on Earth? And um, a good, a interesting uh, perspective is that technology is a wild card, so to say. If once you advance in a certain technology and you solve a lot of problems in space, like sustainability, um, preserving human life, recycling all the materials up there. A lot of those technologies and materials that you develop can be transferred back to Earth. So that's why uh, I think the U.S. benefited a lot from the Apollo program, the space shuttle programs, because we, we spent a lot of money, a lot of time and energy into researching and, and getting a lot of these uh, technologies back and that we were able to incorporate into society and, and benefit and gain an economic boost, so to say. So that's why I think space is that it's mysterious and grand, but a we, we need to know that with technology, um, great technology is indistinguishable from magic, if you heard that quote before. So it's also important for the U.S. and engineers to educate other people of, of how the technology works so they understand it and they don't fear it. So I think that's how s the future of space needs to progress and also how other in industrializing countries and how the U.S. needs to teach other countries um, and show them how to deal with the technology of space exploration. I brought the engine here, so I'll talk a little bit about the engine. So this is our uh, company's um, next engine, next generation engine. Um, this engine features a lot of novel uh, geometries. For example, uh, because we can 3D print, we're not limited to uh, barriers that you see in traditional manufacturing. So if you could see this, I'll pass it around. What, do you, what does this look like to you? A tree, a tree roots, blood vessels. Something, something very um, uh, bio-inspired, very biomimetic. And this is actually nature's way of optimizing fluid flow in a system, right? Uh, and, and we decided, why can't we implement this into hardware? Because 3D printing, with 3D printing, we could create anything. 
So we decided to uh, utilize what nature has optimized and put it in hardware so that we could improve fluid flow, heat management, and performance. And what we see in our simulations and soon our tests is that this engine will perform better than another engine of comparable thrust. It's half the weight, uh, less, less pressure drop, all these, all these benefits you could see by implementing something found in nature. So with added manufacturing, we could uh, obtain all these benefits along with the cost uh, savings, time savings. So this engine is relatively small. It's designed to produce 450 pounds of thrust and operate on liquid oxygen and kerosene as fuel, pretty typical fuels in the aerospace industry. And this is fully 3D printed in one piece. It took four days. And it was printed in Inconel 718. It's a high nickel alloy, uh, super alloy, used by SpaceX in a lot of their parts. And it was, uh, it's the first rocket engine ever to be printed in one piece. Typically, engines would, be, would come in at a minimum three to five pieces uh, at the lower end. And usually, it would go up to hundreds of pieces for like the space shuttle main engine. So this took four days of print when traditionally you could only make it in uh, at least two months going through multiple hands, different facilities. So you could already see the benefits that this could offer to the aerospace industry and other industries around the world. But we decided to focus on the aerospace industry. Thinking 3D printing, I'm thinking the acrylic and plastic. Which yeah. Have been very crude. That looks very different than what people do with the industry. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So you could these days print in almost any material. Albeit the method that we use to print metal is a lot different from plastic. Plastic is an FDM extrusion method. You have a nozzle and you push plastic through it by melting it. Uh, with metal, we have a, a powder bed method. So what, what happens is there's a hopper with a bunch of metal powder, very small, uh, boulder size, 20 microns in diameter. And then it's, there's a printing head that lays a first layer of this metal powder on your build plate. And then you have a 400 watt laser that shoots into a piezoelectric controlled mirror, and that can move the laser around. So you're essentially melting the metal particles together and welding it, so to say. So this is essentially one giant weld. So that's um, after that first layer, the printer head lays another layer, and then it does the same thing. So that's why this took four days to build, because it, it, it went layer by layer, thousands of layers, and essentially you get your part. So that's how metal printing works. So I'll go ahead and pass this around first. So this is pretty small when you're 3D printing it. <coughs> Yeah, so this engine can be used for a small launch vehicle when clustered together, or it could be used for any type of satellite. Right now, we're built, uh, limited by the build volume of the metal printer itself. It's a cubic foot for more, more, uh, most industry standard printers. But recently, the patent on metal printing uh, recently expired, so we, we're seeing a, a growth of startups and other companies around the world that are making uh, desktop metal printers as well. And, and soon the prices will drop, the build volumes will increase. So as we refine our technology, we'll just be able to scale it. So we're already talking with those metal printing manufacturers, and we're partnering with them to create bigger and better printers. Are you yourselves looking into the, uh, 3D printing technology, or you are want to develop for your own purposes to escape your industry? Or? So uh, there are a lot of players trying to go into metal printing. Uh, we, we're looking at the technologies on the horizon, like being able to print in multiple metals in a gradient. Even in uh, metal printing, you have part-to-part -part variation. Because, and what that means is if you, you have the same file, you slice it, press print, it should theoretically be the exact same part. But it, there's some variations in each part. So they, we have to conduct a lot of tests to do that. So there's a lot of actually in situ, um, real time sort of say monitoring methods in order to monitor your part and ensure the, the structural um, material um, quality of the parts. So those are the kind of technologies that we're looking into. Our company specializes in the actual design of the engine. So we, we're, we've created uh, in-house algorithms and scripts, machine learning scripts, to automate the design of the rocket engine, actually. So we could just have boundary conditions of the certain fuel thrust uh, needed, and then the computer will actually uh, have a generative cycle. It'll create, a, will input a basic model, it'll simulate it, and then it'll make 100 variations, small variations in the design, and it'll simulate all of those, and then it'll continue that process until we reach an optimized state for fluid flow and heat flow. So that's what actually uh, sets our company apart, and that's kind of what our patents are based off of. So we specialize in that and also in the specialized post-processing systems needed to make those engines, because 
not only are we going to be the only entity to make those, but we'll uh, design those. We'll be the only entity to make them and then properly test them. So that's that's what we focus on. What advice would you have for our high school students here that are like, whose minds are blown this morning when they think about technology? Okay, so the uh, the first challenge is people taking you seriously. Probably is, is what you'll you'll it will, you'll find out when trying to engage in adult things to, to the outside world. If you show your passion, you know what you're talking about, and you, you say, this is a future I want to paint, then there's literally nothing stopping you. It's just other people's uh, perception of, of you and your experience. So you know that meme where it's like the tip of the iceberg is like, this is what people see, and then underneath is like what people don't realize. That's, that's kind of what it is. It's all, you'll receive a lot of no's in, in your career. So getting those out of the way well, keep, keep the mindset. Getting that out of the way, they'll eventually be a yes somewhere. Um, but the perseverance is definitely an important part of being young and, and having all these ideas. The best thing you could do is, um, what I've seen, surround yourself with more experienced people um, that uh, have a lot of experience, they have a lot of industry knowledge, but they understand your technology and your idea and how important that could be in the future. So surrounding yourselves with those high caliber people will not only give you the weight, but also the credibility to enact all of your ideas. So that's, that's one of the pieces of advice that I've seen uh, works the best for me. So being, able, being taken seriously, especially in the aerospace industry, is, is the biggest challenge. How was it being a CEO and going to college at the same time? It was a juggling act. Um, definitely, definitely um, you, you sometimes get lost in your work. Um, or you stay up late nights and, and you forget what you're doing. Uh, but I was an RA in college, and my boss told me, you know, you need to focus on school, don't fail your classes. Uh, but, of course, there's something that you'll always want to do as a passion. But there are other things that you need to do first in order for you to do what you want to do. So that, that was kind of the mentality is completing the schoolwork, doing what I need to do, and um, after that, I could do whatever I want. So it was a lot of late nights for me. <laughs> uh, first and second years, a lot of uh, learning about time management. So just having a good system in place. Because in, in high school, my, my father, my parents would push me uh, to, to uh, do my homework. Don't go to sleep until I finish or I'm ready for that test the next day. Uh, but in college, that, that kind of mentality really helps you out. So uh, it's, it's a juggling act. But knowing why you're in college, it, to do get your degree is important, and then uh, you could do whatever you want. What you learn with your degree was not necessary for what you do now. What you learn in your degree sets the foundation, because in, in patent law, there's something called prior art. It's everything that, that kind of builds up and leads into your technology. Like for the metal printer, you need the technology for the laser, the technology for the robot to move the head. So going through college, it's like learning all these different theories and ideas, what people, how people approach it in the past, so that you could take that and in your, in you, because you have an idea in your head of how you want to change the future. So going through all these different perspectives and what is currently ac accepted in the world is really important to how you predict and plan of what you want to enact in the future. So I would say, hands-on wise, it it. I gain more from my extracurriculars and my internships, but school-wise, all that theory was the foundation that kind of helped me make the decisions um, that I made in the companies, in, the, uh, in this startup. So I, I would say it's, it's important to pay attention and understand. Be a sponge, essentially. As a first year, I, I scheduled meetings with professors, went to talk to a bunch of people, learned everything, took down notes, and... Um, be open to new ideas, be a sponge, be open to new ideas. That's, that's what allowed me to really take in the whole university environment uh, at a much faster pace and then be able to, to see that more of the playing field at a high level of, okay, I have all this information, this is what all these people think, oh, how do I want to navigate this field now? So it's, uh, definitely being a sponge, talking to people, asking a lot of questions. Um, <clears throat> you could never ask too many questions because uh, as a first year, take advantage of, of being that in, in college. People will, will give you a lot of uh, slack for, for being a first year and not knowing. So take advantage of that, be a sponge. And engineering-wise, hard skills would be SolidWorks, being able to program, being um, um, into all these new simulation 
uh, programs that are out there. I think it's definitely a roller coaster ride. <laughs> you'll you'll definitely have your wins, your big meetings that you accomplish something, get a new ally, but you'll definitely have your losses. Like oh, I could have done better, and and it's important not to beat yourself up over it. Learn what you did wrong and how to improve next time, but always have the end goal in mind. Always have your dream. This is what I want to do, and only you could do it because you've you've dedicated yourself to it. So having that mentality helps carry you through the tough times. Thank you very much.